Good morning. We're very grateful for the opportunity to come to you with this series on premillennialism. It involves also a study of the 24th chapter of Matthew, and finally the second coming of Christ on the third Sunday morning. If you've not yet written for your little study guide, premillennialism, fact or fiction, we invite you to do that this morning because we recognize that you will need this during our study together. We will use it constantly in just a few moments. In recent weeks, our beloved president, and he truly is that to me, got on nationwide television and talked about our commitment as a nation to Israel. He's pleading for $4 billion again this year to shore up national Israel. I'm afraid that the words that he used concerning our commitment to Israel because of their eternal home and their eternal right to the promised land are misconceptions of what the Bible teaches about the nation of Israel and about the Gentile world as a whole. Jerry Falwell recently put out an entire letter writing to the preachers all over America begging us to join together to help national Israel because there's so many of us that are dependent upon them for they are the rightful heirs of the, quote, holy land. The abysmal ignorance of men who describe Israel as having a national inher inheritance in physical Israel today is appalling. Recently on television stations all over the Metroplex, plans were made by churches from all over America as they were being hosted by churches in Dallas, Texas, concerning the need of Christian Israel today. They talked about the fact that since national Israel had been assured an eternal home in the Holy Land by God from the time of Abraham till now, then we needed to restudy and rethink our attitude concerning Israel, that we ought to do everything we can because if our nation will take care of Israel, God will bless our nation. Good people, I hate to say it, but these things are just not so. This morning, I am not politically oriented. I'm simply trying to get men and women to understand what the Bible teaches on the great and wonderful subject of God's use of the nations today. Certainly, the idea of premillennialism is not new. It's a long-sounding word, and it has been described like this. Premillennialism is made up of three parts. Pre, meaning before, millennial, meaning 1,000, and ism means it just ain't so. I recognize that a lot of people believe it. Most religious groups believe it. Individuals walking up and down the street constantly talk about the right of Israel to the Holy Land. Actually, it's a misnomer to call it the Holy Land. It's the biblical lands. Holy Land today means nothing in the eyes of God. There is no piece of real estate on earth that's more precious in the eyes of God than anything else. All of that went away at the cessation of the law of Moses. Now, let us begin our study of our little Bible study guide of premillennialism, fact or fiction. First, let's talk, let's talk about the idea of premillennialism. Recently, it came into my hands a chart by David Reagan of Plano, Texas, the Lion and the Lamb Ministry, as he was seeking to make men understand what really premillennialism is all about. He has a very beautiful chart. It's been well illustrated, beautifully drawn, but it is not true to the Bible. His idea is at the second coming of Christ that a great rapture will take place, that there will be the resurrection of the righteous, that the righteous be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds of glory, and for seven years they'll be there. There'll be a period of great tribulation upon the earth. Then after that period of tribulation, there'll be the resurrection of the wicked. Then the battle of Armageddon will be fought. Then men will go into judgment. Then their eternal destiny will be decided. And then the Lord will reign for a thousand years upon the earth. Not all theories of premillennialism agree one with the other. But roughly speaking, the idea is roughly as Mr. Reagan has described it. The truth of the matter is the Bible does not deal with the great rapture. The Bible does not deal with a final great tribulation on the earth. The Bible does not deal with a thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth. The Bible deals with the fact that the kingdom of God has already been established, that it is a fact, that it is a reality. If you have your Bible, feel free to turn with me as we read these passages. If you do not wish to study the Bible with me right now, write the passages down, send for the study guide. We'll do everything in our power to get it to you in time for next week's study. 
But take these passages down and read for yourself. In Daniel, the second chapter, verse 44, where Daniel is talking about Nebuchadnezzar's great dream and in interpreting that dream, he said, The God of heaven in the days of those kings shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, neither shall the sovereignty thereof be left unto another people. But it shall break in pieces all of the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Both biblical scholars and secular history attest to the fact there were to be four great world ruling kingdoms. There was the Babylonian kingdom of that very day. There was the Medo-Persian kingdom. There was the, the Greek kingdom and then the Roman kingdom. During the days of the Roman kings, God did set up a kingdom which was established upon the earth and exists even till today. Let me read you two or three passages of Scripture found in our little text so that you will understand what Jesus taught and the apostles taught about the coming kingdom in their day, 2,000 years ago. The Bible says in Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then again in Mark 1 and verse 15, Jesus said once again, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ taught that the kingdom was nigh, that it was at hand. No, by no stretch of the imagination could you believe that at hand or nigh would mean something that had not yet been fulfilled in 2,000 years. Again, Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 9 and 10, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Therefore it was future, but it was nigh. It was near at hand. In Mark 9 and 1, Jesus gets very specific when he said, Verily I say unto you that there are some of them that stand by who shall in no wise taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Jesus said there were people living right then that would not die until his kingdom was established upon this earth, that the kingdom was to come with power. That word power is significant. For we learn that when the power is to come, the kingdom is to come. Later on the power came, therefore the kingdom came. The Bible teaches us time and time again that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Luke 19 and verse 10. These passages are all noted in our little text that we're studying. Then in, Acts or in Luke 24 and verse 49, Jesus said that you will receive power when the kingdom of God, or when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the power was to come when the Holy Spirit came. But earlier we learned in Mark 9 and 1 that the kingdom was to come with power. Now the power is to come when the Holy Spirit came. If I can find out when the Holy Spirit came and the power came, then it follows we will know when the kingdom came. You turn in your Bibles to Acts, the second chapter. This is the first Pentecost after the resurrection. Jesus Christ had been resurrected from the dead by 50 days. Jesus Christ had ascended into heaven. Jesus Christ, according to Acts 2, 1 through 4, sent the Holy Spirit from heaven. Now there were gathered at Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. These men were all gathered together in one place. And there came from heaven the sound as a rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the place where they were sitting. And the Holy Spirit sat upon each of them, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, good people, they had power to speak languages they had not studied. Later on in Acts, the second chapter, when Peter began to speak with the eleven apostles, the men who had gathered together from the four corners of Jerusalem, from at least 13, 14 different provinces over the Roman Empire, said, how see we every man, or how hear we every man, in the language wherein we were born? The apostles were speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were actually speaking di dialects and languages, the languages of the people. The people heard in the language wherein they were born. The power to speak in these languages had come from God. The Holy Spirit had come down from heaven, had given the apostles this power. Men cannot speak foreign languages that they have not studied. For 17 and a half years, I worked in Africa as a missionary. I worked very diligently and very hard to learn to speak Swahili. It was a language that I had not learned. If the power of the Holy Spirit had been given me in a miraculous measure, 
I could have spoken that language, would never have had to have studied it. But the power was given to the apostle to speak in those languages according to Acts 2. The Holy Spirit came, the power came, and therefore the kingdom came. Mark 9 and 1, Jesus said that the kingdom is to come with power. The power came when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came in Acts 2, therefore the kingdom came in Acts 2. Premillennialism is fiction because premillennialism teaches that the kingdom of God is yet to come. That is some future nebulous time that is going to be established in Jerusalem and Jesus is going to sit on David's throne. There's not a word in the Bible to teach that Jesus shall ever set foot on this earth again. Any passage found in the Old Testament that men try to take and make to say that was fulfilled when he came the first time. Jesus Christ has ascended back into heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17 says, He shall come in the clouds of glory. Then we shall be caught up to meet him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not one word of Jesus coming back to Jerusalem to sit on David's throne to rule for a thousand years. Jesus Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Peter used those keys in Acts, the second chapter. Acts 2, 11 through about 39, Peter lifting up his voice with the eleven said, This is that which the prophet Joel has said. And then Peter began to preach. Acts 2 and verse 38, the, verse 37, the men were cut to the heart and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Using the kingdom of God, the power of God to open the door to the church, open the door to the kingdom of God for the first time, said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For unto you is the promise, your children, and all them that are afar off, as many as our Lord God shall call unto him. So Peter used the keys of the kingdom in Acts, the second chapter. From that time on, the kingdom of God was a reality upon the earth. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, Paul said, We've been translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The kingdom was already established in Colossians 1 and verse 13. Revelation 1 and verse 5, the Bible says that God made us to be a kingdom and priest, and we reign upon the earth, Revelation 5 and verse 10. So the kingdom is here and now. The words church, body, family of God, kingdom, all refer to the same institution. They're different words, certainly. They have different meanings, but they still refer to the one and the same institution. My mother is in the audience this morning. I am her son. I'm the husband of my wife, the father of my children, the brother of my, the fleshly brother of my brother Charles. I'm the same man, though there are at least four different relationships. Those relationships are not the same, but they refer to the same man. And so it is with the kingdom of God. The church of God and the kingdom of God on this earth are one and the same thing. The kingdom of God is here and now. Premillennialism is not true. Premillennialism is false because Jesus is already upon Christ's throne. In Acts the second chapter, 30 through 35, Peter made the argument that we have the tomb of David with us to this very day. But David said unto my Lord, that thou art my Lord, and I perceive that thou art at my right hand, meaning the right hand of God. God promised and fulfilled that Jesus would sit on David's throne. Peter said that Jesus was sitting upon David's throne both now and he is ruling upon that throne. In Zechariah 6 and verse 13, the Bible says that the promised Messiah would sit and he will rule and be priest upon his throne. Zechariah 6 and 13. Jesus is priest right now, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. We have not a great high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but one who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is priest. He was to sit and rule as he was priest. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Mark 16 and 19, after Jesus has spoken the Great Commission, 
He was received up into heaven and he sat down on the right hand of God. He now sits on the right hand of the majesty of on, on high, Hebrews 1 and verse 3. So he sits, he rules, and he's priest upon the throne of David right now. When Christ comes, the earth will actually burn up. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, 10 through 15, there's no room for a rapture. There's no room for a great tribulation on earth and a rapture in heaven. There's no room for a thousand year reign of Christ upon this earth. In 2 Peter 3, 10 through 15, we learn that when Jesus Christ comes, the earth shall melt with fervent heat. It shall be dissolved. The works and the earth therein shall be burned up. Not for a thousand years will the Lord reign, not even for an hour after he comes, but the earth and the works therein shall melt with fervent heat. There's no room for the thousand year reign. There's no room for Jesus Christ to have a rapture in heaven with the saints. Revelation 20 becomes the sugar stick because in that is found the word thousand years. Well, the word thousand is found many times in the Bible. But the premillennials like to say that Revelation, the 20th chapter, the first six verses, teaches that Jesus Christ will come back to the earth, that he'll sit on David's throne in the city of Jerusalem, and that he will reign for a thousand years, and that we will reign with him. I want you to read Revelation 20, 1 through 6, very, very carefully. There are a number of things about Revelation 20 that is not according to the premillennial theory. Notice the following things. I've listed them in our little booklet. It does not mention the second coming of Christ. It says an angel came down from heaven. It does not mention Christ's reign upon the earth. It mentions the reign of martyrs, but not upon the earth. It does not mention a literal resurrection of the body, but rather talks about those that have been beheaded for the testimony of Christ. It does not mention it does not mention us, but it only mentions the martyrs. And then fifthly, the passage is figurative, not literal, because it says an angel comes down from heaven. It says he has a key to the bottomless pit. There's no such thing literally as a bottomless pit. A bottomless pit would be a cylinder. But all of the figurative language of the passage teaches a great lesson. It teaches that Satan will be bound Satan is bound by the gospel of Jesus Christ right now. Any one following the teaching of Christ cannot be hurt by Satan. He cannot be destroyed. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and no man plucks them out of my Father's hand. Jesus Christ knows that the power through the Word of God is able to guard a man. It's tragic that men feel that there has to be some great miraculous manifestation to cause men to be converted. In the Bible, in Romans the 11th chapter and verse 25, the Bible says, And so all Israel shall be saved. So is an adverb of manner, meaning that just as the book of Romans has presented the gospel for all creatures, both Jew and Gentile, in that same manner, Israel shall be saved. God doesn't have two gospel plans of salvation. He has only one Bible, one way for men to be saved. He only recognizes one way for men to go to heaven. That's why it's so important for men to reject the, the theory of premillennialism and for men who are Jews who are waiting for some cataclysmic event to believe that men will be able to understand something miraculous at the last day to give them a second chance to turn to God and the gospel. The Bible is very, very explicit about what the gospel actually accomplishes. Now let's notice for just a moment that there was a land promise in the Old Testament. God Almighty Himself made the promise to Abraham. And notice what it says. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, in the first three verses, God tells Abraham, Get thee out of the country from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And in all of your families, shall all of the earth be blessed. This was made to Abraham, repeated to Isaac in Genesis 26, 4 through 6, repeated to Jacob in Genesis 28, 11 through 13. So the great promise was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It consists of two things. It consists of a great national promise. 
He would bless the land in which they lived. He also would bless them spiritually. The land promise was fulfilled. It's very easily seen in the book of Joshua in the 23rd, 21st chapter and verse 45. When Joshua got ready to die, notice what Joshua said concerning the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. In the 23rd chapter of Joshua and verse 21, just one page over in your Bible, notice what God says. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, said Joshua, and you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which God your Lord promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you, and not one word of them has failed. Good people, they inherited the land. They received every vestige and foot of land that God promised that nation. God sent them into captivity because they violated the commandment of God. It was never unconditional. They had to live right in order to keep the land. They went into 70 years captivity in Babylon. They went into 70 years captivity into Assyria. They were returned both times. When they came out, they were allowed to inhabit the promised land once again. But then Jesus Christ came and brought the spiritual promise. When you turn in your Bibles to Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 through 29, you learn that even the spiritual promise has now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and that not one single promise made to the Jewish nation is yet lacking. Notice what God said in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, all, that's Jew and Gentile, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. God doesn't look on the Jew different from me today. God doesn't look on the, me different from the Jew today. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Those who are waiting for 40 acres and a mule in Jerusalem are waiting in vain. They who are waiting for a thousand year kingdom wait in vain. Those who have obeyed Christ, been baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, become the heir of Abraham's seed, heir according to the promise. How tragic that men and women will not turn to the Word of God. Paul, in the great book of Romans, said in the first chapter, verses 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. May God bless you and help you to understand the great truth that premillennialism is fiction, that it's a figment of men's fertile imagination, that there's not one word in the Word of God to substantiate it, but rather that Jesus Christ, the apostles, and the whole New Testament stamp it as a lie. Turn to God and obey the gospel while there's time and opportunity. May God bless